As we continue in just an attitude of praise and humbleness before the Lord and reverence, if you would bow your heads, your hearts with me, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. Now, Lord, you are accessible to us because of Christ, because you have made a way for us. Lord, like David, we extol you. We lift you high. Lord, we praise your mighty name. We acknowledge that you are great. You are greatly to be praised. Lord, for who you are, you are mighty and merciful. You are good and gracious. You are just and also the justifier. You are the judge and the redeemer. Lord, your love is wonderfully, powerfully demonstrated at Calvary. You so loved us. You sent Jesus. We praise you for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the cross. We thank you that he shed his blood. And Lord, it was enough, not for some of our sins, but all of it. And so as a redeemed people, Lord, with your spirit, because of Christ, with reverence in our hearts and an attitude of worship, Lord, we come before you. We praise you for who you are, and Lord, we know that you are holy and just. We know, Lord, that Calvary has shown us the damage of our sin, what was necessary to redeem us. And so, Lord, we ask, even though we are in Christ and he has redeemed us, Father, we Realize that we struggle with sin, so our hearts are quick, Lord, to acknowledge our sin. Lord, your your word, your law has exposed it for us. It shows us that all our sin, what it is and how it is against you. So we take a moment and, Lord, we confess. For sins, Lord, that we have known about, maybe ones we're unsure about, thoughts, words, actions, Lord, our heart of pride, often our, our hard heart, and, and Lord, wanting our own way. We just, Lord, ask that you would forgive us. We ask the Holy Spirit to reveal justified, hidden sins, Lord, that we would acknowledge them for what they are, repent of them, turn from them, and follow after you. Lord, like David, we, we simply acknowledge you. You are the one who hears us. And Lord, if, if we go down in dust, who will praise you? So we ask, God, that that you would hear our prayers, that you would be gracious to us, that you would extend your mercy. Uh, We declare, just as David did, that you are faithful. You are the faithful one. You are the one who turns our weeping into a shout of joy. So, God, we plead for your spirit to be with us, turning our weeping into joy, Lord, exposing our sin, that we would repent and find deliverance in you. Lord, we are grateful and thankful that your anger is but for a moment, but your favor is for a lifetime. Lord, you love all those in Christ eternally. It is an eternal promise. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the truth of your word, Lord, that we can know you through your word, that we can trust in you, that you are true to your word and you change not. This is our confidence in our prayer, and so, Lord, we come acknowledging who you are, and, Lord, confessing our sin, pleading your activity, full of thankfulness. We bring to you, Lord, our, our, our supplication, our requests, and, Lord, on my heart is always your church to be an awakened, Lord, to the truth of the gospel, and that sounds like a radical prayer, but, Lord, bring us back to the truths of your word. It matters, Lord, what we believe. We must believe rightly about Christ. We must understand your holiness. We must understand the the wickedness of sin. So, Lord, we pray for your church that there would be a hunger growing in your children, in your sons, and in your daughters, a thirst, Lord, for righteousness, a desire to seek first your kingdom. Lord, there would be a willingness by your Spirit to deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow you. And I pray, Lord, as you stir the hearts of your children, if you would be gracious and merciful to us, that your church would become an example to the community, would impact the community with truth. Lord, the world does not, does not know what it, what it needs, what it longs for. It substitutes anything but you. And so, Lord, I pray for the proclamation of the gospel. Lives would come to know you. I pray for us this morning. Lord, that we would be a light. We would take our walk with you seriously. Lord, that we would be one who would speak, Lord, to 
to the situations of life, that we would bring clarity of understanding. We pray, Lord, for our nation and our states and our local leaders that, again, we would be an impact and a voice. We thank you, Lord, for your goodness that we see in our first responders, in our medical field, Lord, those who serve in our community. We thank you for them. ask for protection over them, those who serve in that way. But Lord, we pray for the families and the marriages, not only in, in our church, and, but in our community. We pray that we would be a voice to those things. Pray that our ministries would have impact. Our leaders would be full of conviction. We believe your word is true. You change not. And all our hope and the healing we need is only found in you. And so God, we look to you and we ask for those this morning who might be going through a physical issue or a suffering in some way, we ask God for your hand to move in a healing way. I pray, Lord, for those maybe struggling to make ends meet and in need of, of your provision financially, we ask God that you would meet that need in a mighty way that just grows our testimony about who you are. I pray for those this morning who might be just simply barely hanging on, trying their, their best, to trust you, I pray, God, you would draw them close to Calvary, that they would never doubt your love for them. Lord, we pray, I pray selfishly for salvation of lost souls. Your word has sent us, Lord, to proclaim your truth. You have given us the great commission. So, Lord, I pray our outreach to be filled with boldness and confidence in the gospel. As we live your word and speak it, God, that we would see souls come to you, not for our sake, but for your great name, that we would declare, just like David, your faithfulness. You are good. You are good all the time. Father, we also take a moment and pray over the offering this morning, those prepared to give again, that our heart would be full of worship and praise, acknowledging that it is you. All our blessings come from you. It is by your goodness, your grace to us. Let our heart be a heart, Lord, that just simply says, thank you for blessing us. Thank you for, Lord, knowing us as sons and daughters and not by our, our resources or our finances. Thank you for the opportunity to worship you that way. We pray your blessing on the offering of used for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that your kingdom would grow here and that Christ would be lifted high. We pray this all in the wonderful and mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This time I'd like to dismiss the children to Children's Church. Which is usually they're willing to go. They don't have to go, but they usually want to go. <clears throat> and the rest of us who, who are uh, just a little bit older, not much, uh, would open your Bibles. Uh, once again, open your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And we've been looking at this letter for some time, and uh, we've come to a passage of Scripture. We'll, we'll look at verses 8 through 13, what I put in your notes, A, which is the first part of verse 13. In a title that I've called, uh, The Blessings of Godly Sorrow. Right? I know some of you might go, that sounds like an oxymoron. It is not. And we'll see, and we we'll read the passage here in a moment, you'll see it. Um, you know, Paul is has had some hesitancy, right? He's had to deal with a difficult church. And we see the human side. I know sometimes, I don't know if, you're, if you've been like this, and sometimes I just see Paul as such a, just a hero, right? That there's, there's almost a machine, right? It just keeps going. Well, there's a human side to Paul. Of course, right? And we see it in these moments of him, him praying over the church, his concern for the church, and, and him writing this letter, right? Whether it's the first letter of 1 Corinthians or this, uh, another letter to the Corinthians as he references in chapter 2 of this, of 2 Corinthians. This severe letter, it was a severe thing he wrote. He confronted sin. And he felt just a lot of anxiety over this. And yet it leads him to, to, to praise. When Titus comes back, he's excited. And he'll tell us here in a moment when we read it that he's not, he's not, he's not excited over the fact that they're sorrowful. That's not his, that's not his goal. But that there is godly sorrow. And he says, this is the will of God. This is, this is a good thing. Uh, there's reconciliation. All these things that happen. 
And I think for us, you know, we, we want to we step into this text and we always want to say, what are some applications? You know, what are some things that we want to grab hold of that's God's word, that this is how God's word, or his church rather, through his word, is to function? What should we be seeing in our own lives? Right? Well, we see in Paul a, a, a seriousness, right, a, of sin. He wants to deal with this sin. He wants to confront this sin. It's it's not something that he like enjoys, right? But it's something that has to be done. And I think you know the, the for us, and of course every church needs to take this to heart. There should be uh, in us, right, a godly sorrow when we're sin- sinning against God. There should be something motivating us, right, a, a spirit that brings us to humility to say, "Lord, please have mercy upon me, a sinner." Right, as we see in Luke eighteen in the parable of the tax collector and the Pharisee. But I think this is something that, that we need to realize that this is a blessing of God. When God moves on his church, he moves in his children, that, that there is a sorrow against sinning against him. There was a story of a, of a little girl, uh, well, old enough to, to go to church and old enough to understand the gospel. And uh, she had come many times and the gospel was communicated and she had repented. She had believed in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And so moved by that, the following Sunday, she came back and asked the pastor, not only have I believed in Christ, I want to to be a member of your church. And so the pastor said, well, well, were you you a sinner? Oh, yes, she replies. And then he asked, are you still a sinner? And she said, yes, I still am. Well, then he asked the question, what has changed? And she said, the best way I can put it is that when I didn't know Christ, I ran after sin. But now that I know him, I run from it. And I think you'll see in this passage the Corinthians, right, who are apathetic and dealing with sin issues in their church. And Paul's severe letter grabbed them by the shoulders and shakes them. And now you see a church that's running from it. And running after the Lord. So we've, we see this is starting in verse 8. I'll read through the first part of 13. And Paul says this. He says, For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not re- regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. Now I rejoice. Not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of Repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. The sorrow of the world produces death. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you, What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. And everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. So although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the offender nor of the sake of the one offended, but that your earnestness on our behalf, might be made known to you in the sight of God. For this reason, we have been comforted. Let me offer a brief prayer. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity in which to assemble in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Father, now we ask that your Spirit would be with us, teaching us, instructing us, Lord, growing us, convicting us, whatever is necessary, Lord, that we will be closer to you. Give us ears to hear, I pray, and eyes to see. And Lord, get me out of the way that we would receive what you have for us today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned excuse me, last week, is we talked about this element of trusting, right? What does is, what is trusting God lead to? Ultimately, we've come to this passage, right? Trusting God means we come to his word, we believe in his word, and when his word convicts us of sin... We trust in his provision for our sin. Right? That's what's happening to the Corinthians. Last week I, I had mentioned that Paul was trusting in God's uh, purpose 
I mean, we see the anxiety of Paul writing these things and uncertain of, of not meeting up with Titus, not sure how this church is going to deal with Titus, right? He was probably thinking, oh my goodness, they're going to string this guy up. We don't know what they're going to do. But he trusts the Lord's purpose, and of course he trusts in his providence. You know, despite the situation, the Lord is, is moving. He, he places us in situations of life where maybe we're left, maybe scratching our head a little bit, right? But we trust that he is not absent and he's leading us through. That will come into play, of course, in every area of our life as we begin to think about God theologically, right? God is ever-present in his omnipresence. There's never a moment that you're out of his presence, as Psalm 139 says. Where could I go? Right? You're everywhere. So the Lord is always with us, even though we might walk through situations of life where we may not have the answer to the side of eternity. We trust in God. Because we know this is just for a short amount of time, right? Compared to eternity, this is but a vapor. And then we saw in the Corinthians last week, they were trusting God in his correction. And now Paul is going to expand that for us a little bit. Right? They are growing in their love for the church. They were mourning over their sin. They had a zeal for ministry. And see, Paul wrote in in Romans chapter 2, verse 4, that it's the, the kindness of God that leads you to repentance. And so we see that language in these verses. It is the will of God, right? It's brought you to godly sorrow. It is God at work, right? That's why it sounds like an oxymoron, the blessings of godly sorrow. But Paul knows when there is brokenness over, over our sin, right, against the Lord, it is the Lord at work. Why? Because our sin nature isn't naturally going to do that. We are by nature selfish, Right? We don't naturally want to come and say, hey, how do I humble myself and come before Christ or come before God or acknowledge my sin? The world today, those outside of Christ, look upon the cross at Calvary as somebody telling me how I must live my life. They see it as judgment. And the believer sees what? Mercy, profound mercy, forgiveness, and grace. So Paul knows this. And so to, to, to step into this text, I have looked simply four things uh, to work through this morning. And I pray they edify you, encourage you, and strengthen you. Because this is not something that we, I don't know, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, I'm not sure. We don't talk, uh, typically talk about being sorrowful, right? So that's not a way to build a church, right? You don't talk about sin and repentance and godly sorrow. Those things are depressing. But I hope that you'll see in this passage the hand of God and the mercy of God. And when he moves on a church, there is always a humbling. There's a reverence. There's a hunger. And there's an acknowledgement of our sin. It is godly sorrow. These are good things. So my first point simply is this. Godly sorrow is a reaction to the seriousness of sin. We have to say, well, you know, what is sin? This is sin, right? They are, they are this church, uh, neglecting, right? They're, they're uh, justifying or simply saying, you know, it's, it's not, a, not a big deal, some of the things that were going on. Paul says in these verses, for though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it. Now he's referencing, right, a letter, writing to them a severe, his severe ter- teaching, right, a hurt, I think is kind of the, the idea. He hurt them. With his letter, he is addressing the seriousness of this sinful matter. If you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he was, he was dealing with the sinning brother who had, was having uh, sexual relations with his father's wife, who's most likely a stepmother, right? And he says, this kind of sexual immorality is not even known among the Gentiles, and you guys are putting up with it. And so his, his stern reaction is, hey, you need to cast this brother out of the fellowship. You need to go straight to the last step of, of church discipline. He says, put his, his flesh towards Satan that his soul might be saved. Right? I mean, talk about shaking someone's shoulder. Hey, you can wake up. So here he's saying, look, I, you know, I caused you sorrow by my letter, but I do not regret it, though I did regret it. And you see the heart of Paul. It's, it's not an easy thing to confront sin, but this is what he's doing. But then he says, for I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though for only a while. I now rejoice. Not that you were made sorrowful. He'll talk about the difference between godly and world, worldly sorrowful here in a moment. Sorry, rather. But not that I made you sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. 
We could summarize this point quite quickly and say Paul states the seriousness of sin and the necessity of repentance. That is, in essence, what he is saying. He's been writing to a church that's been a little bit apathetic, right? They've, they've kind of said, well, these are kind of like guidelines. These are suggestions. And you know what? Paul doesn't talk that well, and he's not, the, he's not really an apostle. All those excuses. And, right, and, and we're good at, at conjuring up excuses when the truth hits us and we don't like it. So Paul is dealing with this church, and so I can imagine when Titus finally shows up to him and he's written this severe letter, his first question is like, okay, man, it's one thing, praise God, you're alive, right? That's good. How was their reaction? How did they take it? I I can see that. I can see Paul going, what did they say? What's going on, man? I'm so thankful you're alive. You know, that's probably not that bad. But maybe I have to ask this question. I mean, why, why is Paul writing something that he knows? Right? It's going to make them sorrowful. Why does, why does he have this on his heart? I mean, he knows the Corinthians are going to react in one or two ways. They're going to be humbled, right? And do what, what's actually happening. Or they're going to resent him all the more. And I see this, right? I mean, Paul is the spiritual father of this church. He planted this church. He takes seriously all the churches. He has a concern for the church. But we see this in a, in a parallel between parenting, right? Those who've had children, you know, right? If the child is erring and you said, hey, look, um, you do that one more time, dad's going to get the spoon, right? That was my, our kids. They're like, oh, the wooden spoon. But you had to follow through. And so if they did it one more time, it broke your heart, but you had to follow through. One time when I was a youth pastor in Oklahoma, a parents and his son were sharing me the story one time that he was acting up in church and the father had told him, hey, you do this one more time, we're going to go outside. Middle of service, we're going to go outside. Dad's going to take you to the, take, take you to the truck. In Oklahoma, everyone drives a truck. And so, right, we're going to take you to the truck and dad's going to spank you. And he did it one more time, whatever it was, I don't recall. And so on the way out, his, his son was pleading for mercy and he asked his father, hey, dad, can we just pray about this first? <laughs> And the son was a big left of time now. He was older, right? And they we were laughing about it. And he said, of, of, his response, of course, son. Of course we can pray about this. And so he goes, we went to the truck, and we prayed about it. And then I spanked him, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it was worth a shot, I imagine, he was thinking. But here's, here's Paul. Here's what's happening. I mean, Paul is writing to a church that, is, that needs to be shaken, that need to be confronted of their sin. It's time, right? And if you want to go metaphorically, he needs to spank them. You need to wake up. You're you're being calloused with sin. You're allowing these things to go unchecked. And and he realizes this isn't easy. It's not easy to confront sin. I mean, think about it in your own walk. Is it easy for you if you know if you're close to a brother or a sister in the Lord to say, hey, I'm going to confront this person? That's not easy. What about hearing someone who says, man, I love you enough, but this is what I'm seeing? That's not easy. But it doesn't, you know, if there's sin, the seriousness of sin, it must be confronted. Now, notice that Paul's desire here is not to make them sorrowful. That's not his goal. I don't want to make you sorrowful. I want to see you come to repentance. I want to see you know the Lord. I want to see you trust the Lord. I want you to realize sin is serious. Remember Paul, chapter 5, verse 10. We all stand before the, the, that judgment seat. Paul, I mean, his concern for the church is that, man, when you're there and you're standing before the judgment seat, I want you to be saturated in Christ, that you have no fear of that moment because you have Christ. You've heard that saying, right? There's, there's in, in uh, any sports or anything, there's no gain without some pain, right? I mean, I think uh, in our spiritual walk, there's, there's no growth in our spiritual walk without some, some difficult stuff we have to acknowledge. Right? If, our, if, our, if we're in sin, man, we need to call it sin. We, we can't go about and say, oh, they're fine. Let's just, you know, let's just leave them alone. It would have been easy for Paul to just not go through any of this, wouldn't it? But you see his love. You see his, his concern. He realizes that the wages of sin, right, as he wrote in Romans 6.23, is death. And if there's not repentance, there's no hope. 
So here we see this church who is being serious right now, being shaken up or shaken up, and they're coming to the point of realizing, hey, this, this is serious business, this sin thing. We've got to deal with this, right? There, there is a work of God happening. There is repentance happening. There's the acknowledgement of sin happening. There's the, the confrontation of the sinning brother or multiple brothers or whatever the situations might be that are going on in the church. They're dealing with them. And Paul is saying, man, I had to write some hurtful words, but it's, it's come to this conclusion that that's been good for you. Right here, love, we, as we know, is a verb. And, and in this context, it is the act of discipline. Paul has told them in verse 3, I do not speak to condemn you. That's not my end game. That's not my goal. But rather to die with you, to live with you. Right? But I'm not. You see, in Paul, he's not going to compromise God's word. How do we die with each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord? And how do we live uh, with each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord? Well, we're made sorrowful according to the will of God. We acknowledge sin. See, through God's word, Paul makes known, right, to the people. He is citing this against God's word, and so God is stirring their hearts. Spirit leads them to repentance. But here's the question, right? We, we hear this, what happens or what can happen if we allow sin to just go unchecked? What happens if we allow sin to go unchecked in a church? You turn with me, if you will, to Isaiah chapter 6. I just want to read the first 10 verses as you see the commissioning of Isaiah, but I want you to notice the Lord calls him to. Isaiah chapter 6, first 10 verses, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet. And with two he flew, and one called out to the other, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the threshold trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Now listen to the commission. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And he said, go and tell this people, keep on listening, but do not perceive. Keep on looking, but do not understand. Render the hearts of, the, of this people insensitive, their ears dull, their eyes dim. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and return and be healed. Now think about this for a moment. <clears throat> we see this picture of Isaiah standing in the throne room of God. We see the holiness of God filling the temple. And he is the thrice holy God. He acknowledges, right, his sin. Woe is me. I am undone. I don't belong here. I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips. Acknowledges his sin. God cleanses him of his sin, forgives him of his sin. From the angel takes the coal, touches his lips. Then God commissions him to a people who will not repent. That's his message. When people don't repent, they become what they revere. In his book, We Become What We Worship, uh, G.K. Bill says this, Isaiah is to tell these idolaters that they have been so unrepentant about their idol worship that God is going to make them as spiritually insensitive, as spiritually inanimate, and lifeless as the idols. 
He goes on to say, here, unbelieving Israel is being given what they want. They are punished by means of their own sin. The principle, he says, throughout his book is this. We resemble what we revere either for ruin or restoration. Isn't this exactly what Paul says in Romans chapter 1? See, if there is not a heart of repentance, if sin goes unchecked, unchallenged, we end up being turned over to it. So in our own lives, in our own walk, there is not godly sorrow over sin in us. The reality is maybe God is giving us over to it. Like, listen to what the Hebrew writer says in chapter 12, verses 4 through 8. You have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood in your striving against sin. And you have not, excuse me, and you have forgotten the exaltation which is addressed to you as sons. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you endure. God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, if you're without discipline, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate children, not sons. Now here, the Hebrew writer is talking about those outside, right? What about the believer? What about those who profess Christ? We not see a godly sorrow and the seriousness of sin. Now the goal, just like Paul, my goal is not to make anyone sorrowful. But to see us come, take sin seriously to repentance. It's against God we sin. This can happen individually. We see in Romans chapter 1. Because this can happen corporately to the church. We see this in the churches of Revelation 2 and 3. But the other side is just as powerful. If there is a sorrowful over sin, if there is a sensitivity that is growing in you, then we can rejoice, just like Paul. It's a cause for joy. So this is what we see in the church. There's a church that is, that is apathetic. There's apathy, and Paul has written some harsh things. And they have responded because... God is at work. God has brought, right, a tender heart to, the, to his word. And there's a, an acknowledgement of the seriousness of sin. And there is a, a repentance. And, and Paul rejoices over it. So when we see godly sorrow in our life, it's not a bad thing. It is a blessing because we're simply acknowledging, God, I've, I have come uh, just like the, the tax collector. I'm unable to lift my eyes to the temple. I simply, all I can do is beat my chest. And I can say, Lord, have mercy on me, a, a sinner. And we see in that parable the grace of God and Jesus say he went home justified. James tells us, right, that uh, God gives greater grace. God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. So we have to come and deal with sin rightly. It may be tough. It may be hard, but it is good. We must call sin what it is. So Paul says, here's what's happening. Man, I, I regretted it at first. I didn't want to make you sorrowful, but you repented with godly repentance. There's godly sorrow to which I rejoice. Right? Paul is excited. So that's what we see, right? Godly sorrow is a reaction to the seriousness of sin, the things happening in our life. My second point of verse 10 is godly sorrow will lead us ultimately closer to God. How can it not he says in verse 10, For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. The sorrow of the world produces death. Right now, so we might be thinking in our minds, Pastor, you know, mourning over my sin. I don't know if that makes me feel any closer to God. Mourning is not those positive things. We don't like that, that word. It's a rough word. It's associated with difficult things and suffering, but... This is a very good thing. Remember, Paul has told them, right? God comforts the depressed, right? Those who are going without, when he was worried about Titus and the message, all these things in verses 6 and 7, he says, this is God. Again, James 4, 6, God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace 
to the humble, right? This is who God is. So these are good things. So sorrow, according to the will of God, produces a repentance without regret. At the end of your life, when you stand before that judgment seat and your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, you are not going to regret this moment where you repented of your sins. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to regret this. It's what he's saying. Some of us think, I've come to believe on Jesus Christ. I have this light and this life change. But maybe I should just kind of keep it under a bushel, right? No, keep it under a bushel, let it shine. And look at the contrast, right? There's repentance or remorse. There's salvation or death. He takes godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. So we have to understand what this is about. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. It's things saying, I don't regret that ugly life I once lived. I don't regret kneeling at the cross of Calvary. I don't regret the life change. I don't regret saying, Lord, how do I deny myself, pick up my cross and go forward? I don't regret this. That's a lot different than worldly sorrow. David knew this. David in Psalms 51, 17 says what? The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Remember David was, was mourning over his sin. And his brokenness leads him to cry out to God. And what does he know? God will, God will receive him. God will forgive him. So again, we have to realize that sin is against God's word, right? Paul says in Romans 7, verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, for I would not have known about coveting if the law had not said, You shall not covet. Right, so when we talk about sin, it's defined according to God's word. This is where godly sorrow comes from. We've committed sins against God. That's what David writes about in Psalms 51. My sin is against you, you only. This is where it comes. An example of this is Peter. If you think about Peter's life, right? The moment where he denies Christ and the rooster crows. You realize that Luke paints this picture for us that there was eye contact. He's looking at Jesus across the court. And the rooster crows, and yet that wonderful sociology moment, right, where everything is communicated in his eyes, looking into Peter, and Peter looking into Jesus. Imagine that feeling. He remembers. Listen to Matthew 26, 74, 75. Then he began to curse and swear by the Lord, right? I do not know the man. This is Peter speaking. And immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. He's broken. He has sinned against God. He has denied God. He's denied Christ. But there's one thing we see in Peter's life, and we know this, right? Just like our scripture reading. David knew this. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for the night. The joy comes in the morning. It's a godly sorrow that leads to repentance and makes us right with God will never be regretted. Never be regretted. Salvation is a restoration, fullness of life, a hope the world cannot know. Paul says, this is the sorrow that God has worked in you. But then he tells us, right? He contrasts, but sorrow of the world. There is a sorrow of the world. produces death one leads to repentance and and restoration in god that's godly sorrow and one is is simply worldly sorrow which is being really sorrowful over being caught getting caught with doing wrong it's a violation of one's values it's caused by by that moment when someone found you out oh i feel sorrowful or, or there's a moment where you have to suffer consequences for your actions. I'm sorrowful. You might get punished. Who's an example of this? Is Judas. Judas was filled with remorse. What does Judas do? Does he cry out to the Lord? No, he returns to the chief priests. Listen to Matthew 27, 3 through 5. Then 
Uh, Then when Judas, who had betrayed him, Jesus, saw that he had been condemned, he felt remorse, worldly sorrow, and returned the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. But they said, what is that to us? See that to yourself. He threw the pieces of silver into the temple sanctuary and departed, and he went away, and he hanged himself. Where does he go? He doesn't cry out to the Lord. He got caught. Peter shows godly sorrow. Jesus later restores him. Jesus has worldly sorrow. Leads him to what? Suicide. See, worldly sorrow works death. You may know of folks like this. It eats a person up with guilt with remorse, with depression, despair, defeat. Nowhere to turn. It embitters. You know somebody who struggles has just a bitter spirit. There's rebellion, right? Resentment. Resent. I remember being, I shared this a few weeks ago, doing a funeral at uh, someone who just hated God. And while I was preaching about our hope in Christ, he was off to my peripheral and shaking his head, just hating God for the loss of his child. Bitter. Peter repents. He comes back to the apostles. God restores. Listen to what Luke says, Luke 15, 1 through 7, which is the passage going into the prodigal son and all this. But before he says that, Jesus says these things. Now all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near him to listen to him. Both the Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them a parable, saying, What man among you, if he has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open pasture and go after the one which he has lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing and when he comes home he calls together his friends and his neighbors saying to them rejoice with me for i have found my sheep which was lost i tell you in the same way there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance you think God is excited about when someone comes to believe on Christ? You better believe it. Do you think he's excited about those who take sin seriously? You better believe it. Do you think this, this element draws us closer to God? You better believe it. What does God desire to see in us? Godly sorrow draws us closer to God, not away from him. I mean, think about all the, the, the church philosophy of saying, don't use words like sin and repentance. I don't know about you, but call my sin out that I might come to repentance. I want to be closer to God. I mean, we have to look at Paul's life, those who hold to that philosophy and say Paul was a failure because at the end of his life, he says what? I am the chief of sinners. Is he sinning more? No, he's growing more. He's maturing more. He's growing in his holiness, and the closer he gets to God, the the more he realizes the, the, the difference between him and the holiness of God. Full of repentance he is, it draws us closer. So we see, right, the, the godly sorrow is, is being taking uh, sin seriously. It is being closer to God. My third point is this. Godly sorrow generates a hunger for holiness. Of course, God is at work in us. His spirit, the solidarity with the gospel, with Christ, his mission, the spirit's at work in us. These are the things that we could say, yes, godly sorrow is a blessing. He says in verse 11, for behold, what earnestness... This very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you. What vindication of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong. In everything, you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in this matter. I think, and you may, I I assume you agree with me, the church today needs a desperate need of some godly sorrow. Christians should be experiences. Again, it's not to be sorrowful for the sake of being sorrowful. That's not the point. The point is that there would be genuine repentance. There would be a growing closer to God. There would be a growth in our holiness. 
This is what we want to see happening in the church. See, as someone who's full of God's spirit is going to begin to love God's word. We're going to begin to love God's law, his moral law written on our hearts. We're going to love his commands. We're going to love other brothers, sisters in the church. We're going to love the pursuit of holiness. That's going to be in you. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect, right? We're always going to, I hate it, it suffers that qualification, but I just want to say it. It means direction. Right? Salvation produces a change in direction. Look what he says to this church. Listen to this word. For behold, what earnestness. I mean, these are the same guys that are real apathetic, right? We're like, Paul, you know, one day he'll get it right, right? Some, at some point. Maybe God will have mercy on him. He'll figure it out. I mean, this group now is earnest. They are ready. The word means ready to expend energy. An effort. I think there's a principle here. Devotion to God takes effort. You're just not going to wake up one day and be holy. It takes direction. It takes steps. It takes moving. It takes reading God's word. It takes a heart of repentance. It takes moving, right? I mean, you've got to go in a direction. If you notice this, right, it's, we see the, the, the repentance that leads to salvation. It, we see the godly sorrow that leads us to, to obedience and God's will, desiring. We see con, uh, conversion leading to diligence. We see this diligence is it's communicated in effort. Paul lists these things out and says, man, you guys are, are no longer uh, in this mode of apathy. You're in a mode of diligence. There's an earnestness here. That's why I say there is a hunger for, for holiness. The word apathy, I thought it was funny, this, this quote from the famous author unknown. It says, the nice thing about apathy is you don't have to exert yourself to show you're sincere about it. <laughs> well, that's so true, right? Isn't that apathy? But this is not the Corinthians. God has had mercy upon them. This is according to the will of God. There is sorrowful, godly sorrowful, leading to repentance. And no doubt there are some who are coming to salvation. I mean, you see the beaming smile on Paul's face as he writes these things. And look at these. I mean, how are they showing their diligence? He says, what vindication of yourselves? Here's a group of people that's no longer justifying or hiding or giving license to or defending sin. Now, we've we got to extend mercy to them, no doubt, right? It's all brand new to them. But now they're learning. They're implementing they're vindicating themselves this way. He says, what indignation. Here's the heart attitude of these people. They're not just saying this stuff. There is a heart change in them. They have a righteous anger about sin. They're upset about it. Their thinking has changed. The Heidelberg Catechism asks this question. It says, what is the dying away of the old self? Right? I mean, that's what's going on here. They're dying away of old self. And here's the answer. It is to be genuinely sorry for sin, to hate it more and more, and to run away from it. We should memorize that, right? Be sorrowful, genuinely sorry about sin, hate it more and more, and run away from it. That's like the girl at the beginning. When I, before I knew Christ, I ran towards sin. Now I run from it. So Paul says, look, this is what's going on. They've got indignation. There is a different thinking about all of this. And then he says, what fear, what longing. Right? They have a reverence for God. Not only do they have a reverence for God, they have a reverence for God's messenger. No longer were there, was there a, a separation between them and Paul. They're like, Paul, not only do we, do we long for God's word, we long for you. That's a radical change. And then it goes on and says, what zeal? Zeal is, is extending energy for Christ. So we see the life change. It's not just that we believe this. We think differently about this. We long for God's word in us. We long for his word to be communicated through us. That is what's happening in this group of people. And then he ends here by saying, what avenging of wrong. Now, it needs to be understood. They're not simply saying, hey, we had no, we had no part in this stuff. He's not saying that. He's saying he, they've corrected the situation. Moving forward, these things will not happen. We know too much about the Corinthians to think it the other way, right? <clears throat> and so he says, in everything, they demonstrated themselves to be innocent. Our hearts are turned, our thinking is turned, our desires for Christ 
were growing in this. They fixed the problem. They're growing in love for Jesus, for Christ, for Paul. There was a father one time who was watching his boys, his, one of his sons, build with blocks. And the child had said out loud, I'm building, I'm now going to build a church. Church building with blocks. Father's pride kind of puffed up a little bit. Look, oh, look at my boys building the church. And then the son went on to say, you know, we, we, uh, we must be very quiet. And he immediately thought, his, well, my son is a reference in the church. So he asked his son, and of course his pride puffing a little bit, my son has a heart for the Lord. Son, why, is, why, are the, why must we be quiet in church? And his response was quick and to the point because the people are all asleep. <laughs> There's a parallel to our own lives, isn't it? We might be awake. Are we spiritually awake? Is there a hunger in us? And do you treat sin seriously? Is your repentance, is your worship, does it have, does it have tears? We understand that, that we are like Paul. The closer we get to God, the more we realize I don't belong here. But he so loved me. We don't want to be those who are asleep. It takes effort. We don't want to be those who are full of apathy. We want diligence. We don't want to think like the world. We want to think like Christ and have a zeal for him. We know we're not going to be perfect. We need brothers and sisters to hold us accountable and at times hold us up. And likewise, we need to be those who hold others up. That's a church. My last point here is all of this, your, your independent walk with the Lord, your godly sorrow strengthens everybody else. In verses 12 through 13, he says this, so although I wrote to you, it was not for the sake of the offender, nor for the sake of the offended. Right? He's told us that already. It's not, my goal isn't sorrow. Even though he dealt with the situation, that's not the end game for Paul. This is but contrast that your earnestness on our behalf might be made known to you in the sight of God. Then he says, for this reason I have been comforted. Paul has a love for the church. He loves the brothers and sisters. His desire is that as they see this happening in them, they would realize God is at work in them. And I want you to notice, right? Paul is writing this letter, and yet he is the one who is encouraged. Their response to, to what God is doing, their humbleness, their repentance, encourages him strengthens him. See, I think, you know, godly sorrow when it's working in your life and there's moments maybe in worship where tears are coming down your face and your brothers and sisters know what you're going through and yet you're here with your hands raised and your mouth saying and proclaiming there's power in the blood. There is redemption, not in part, but in whole. There is an anchor for my soul that never changes. And he bids me come just as I am. I don't know about you, but if I know, right, if I'm standing next to you, my eye will have tears. I've shared this before that the most depressing day I have been at this pulpit was the day when none of us were here on a Sunday. And I had to preach a message so we could put it on audio during COVID. There is something about being with God's people when, when they lift their voices in worship, when they realize the, the things that God is working in them, he's also working in others. See, I believe, and I, I know, I know you. You don't want to be around a bunch of people who want to play church. You want to be around people who are going to be the church. And I hope that you realize that in your brothers and sisters that their conviction is contagious, just like your conviction and your love for the Lord is contagious. Why? Because it shines through us. And it, it exudes from us. I mean, nobody wants to be around the person, and no person can benefit if your statement is, I am the sinner of the world. Paul writes to this church, and he sees godly sorrow, and he realizes this is a work of God because it goes against the flesh. 
There is a repentance of sin. There is a moving of the Lord. And what is Paul doing? He is strengthened. So when God moves and he brings about godly sorrow in your life, it strengthens others, not just you. I mean, Paul has this, this comparison, right? He, he, the, the joy, the, the, the working, the moving, but it's all about this church. It's all about these Corinthians realizing what God is doing in them. He wants them to see it. Right? They write the letter, they're broken, but yet their change is strengthening others. And no doubt, seeing others in the congregation repent and take seriously sin and growing in their holiness is stirring others up. So Paul intended, and he tells them, even though it wasn't about the offender or the offended, even though we dealt with that, it was about the bigger picture. By dealing with this sin issue, Paul's relationship now has changed to that whole church body. They realize God is at work. Paul is comforted. Paul is encouraged. Paul realizes that his labor in this church is not in vain. God has been merciful. He realizes that God has his people and he's got some in Corinth. They're taking God and his word seriously. See, God has his people in, in, in Atwater, USA, or Winton, USA, and claim them both, I guess. See, when you take the word of God seriously, when you take God seriously, when you start to say, you know what, that's sin, and I'm going to repent of that, I'm going to turn from it. And others in the church see you different. That is encouragement. God has his people. He has them here. And your love for the Lord, your conviction for the Lord, your, your worship, your attendance, your struggles, and your accountability, it strengthens others. When I was at Bible College, we always had guest pastors come and speak in our chapel times. And I remember this one speaker, and I don't know why I remember this story. That he was at a church, and he, would, he was preaching, and he would always have a time of prayer at the end of his church and invite some to just invite the congregation to come and pray. And his son, one of his youngest sons, would always get up and come down. First one down. He would do this every time. And he knew he's closing up this one Sunday. He's preaching again. He's going to ask people to come. They want to come down for prayer. And, and sure enough, his son, the first one up down there. And he remembers thinking, what are people going to think of me? My son's always coming down here praying. And he got a little upset. But just as he had that thought, he was convicted. Because he thought to himself, am I really upset that my son's heart is tender? towards God and his holiness. And that moment where his son, his faithfulness, being faithful to God, getting up and just coming down and praying, not knowing what's going on, there is a change in his father, the pastor. The simple things of devotion, the simple things of godly, godly sorrow in my life, Lord, help me. When, they, when others see the seriousness, when you start treating sin this way, they see you growing closer to God. They see you hunger and thirst for righteousness, for holiness, to start working out your salvation and sanctification. There will be an impact on the whole church body. Others will want to be a part of that too. See, this is how God manifests his presence to a world that is dark, is when his people get serious with his word. God visits them. What did it take? It took Paul saying some hard things. And Paul at first was unsure, but brought about a change. Not by Paul. The Holy Spirit through Paul is writing scripture. So like us, just like that little girl at the beginning, we should be those who are running from sin, not compromising. We're going to close here with uh, a simple song, it's, Lord, I need you. And it starts with a confession. Verse 1 says, Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one who guides my heart. 
So as we sing this, I encourage you just to, to close this. Is, is, is God at work in you? Is there sorrow in you? Not for the sake of sorrow, but for the point of repentance. Because all our sin is against God. See, your seriousness with God affects everybody else. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are good, not sometimes, all the time. Your word is good, and there, there are moments in your word that are, that are tough. We need to hear them. We need to know, Lord, what your word calls sin. And we need to see, Lord, when we commit those sins, that it's against you. And by your spirit, Lord, when those moments you would lead us to repentance, to godly sorrow, not for sorrow's sake, to repentance. You would grow us and mature us in Christ. I pray, Lord, for each of us this morning, we would take this to heart. I, I pray that we would not walk out of this service and just simply say, so what? That we would not respond in apathy, but in diligence to your word. So, Lord, regardless of where we're at in our walk with you, you know us better than we know ourselves. We ask, I'd, I ask, you minister to us. Bring about the conviction in those areas, but draw us close and let us realize that this is a blessing. Godly sorrow is a good thing because it brings us closer to you. So, Lord, draw us close according to your word and for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.